Uh, so good afternoon everybody to everybody down in the Pollock, and thanks so much for joining us for this, the sort of final event in our 2023 feature series, Big Screen, and the final event of the academic year. Um, my name is Tyler Morgenstern. I am the Assistant Director of the Carsey Wolf Center, and it's my great pleasure to moderate this afternoon's discussion with our extremely special guest who's on screen with me here, celebrated director and screenwriter Todd Field. Todd, welcome. Thank you. Good How to meet you. Here. Hello, everyone. <laughs> You'll have to just sort of imagine a theater full of people downstairs, but... Um, so we've just uh, been able to get through TAR, and I really uh, just have to say uh, we're so delighted to have you with us this afternoon to talk about this remarkable film. It's truly one of my favorite films of the last several years, maybe one of my favorite films, period. Um, and it's such a delight and such a thrill to be able to see it again on a big screen with proper sound down in the Pollock. Um, it's such a thrill to see this film that's so fully realized sort of the way that it really should be seen. Um, every time I've seen it, I've been so struck by um, what you've been able to achieve aesthetically and technically. The film feels both sort of sweeping and ambitious and almost kind of wild in its scope. And maybe we'll talk about that in a bit. But it's very sort of sleek and elegant and restrained in its execution in a lot of ways. So there's obviously lots to talk about with this film thematically and the ideas that you that you contend with and, and the themes. Um, but before we get to that, I wonder if I could just ask a really broad question, which is if you can speak about the sort of vision for the film, how was it that you imagined this world of Lydia Tars? Because it really is a world. If she's nothing else, if not a kind of orchestrator and a manager of a very particular kind of world. Um, so how did you think about creating that space, creating that whole universe around her, um, particularly since it's so different from the the kind of scenarios and the and the the landscape of your prior two films, which are both take place in these small bucolic New England towns and play out more as chamber dramas and so take place on a somewhat smaller scale. Um, so I wonder if you can just talk us through about the making of the world of tar. Right. Um... Well, you know, I, I mean, uh, yes, there's a contrast between this setting and, say, you know, some fairy tale, leafy um, Massachusetts suburbia and then uh, a small coastal town in Maine. Um, but those are just backdrops, you know. I think that, that um, I'm interested in human beings. Um, and um, this was a character who... And also, I think it's probably worth pointing out that, you know, one stark difference is that those were both adaptations. Um, and so the characters that were were in those other two films, I really, I was blessed because I, I was in dialogue with the creators and the authors of that underlying material. Um, and those people um, were wonderful to collaborate with, you know, Andre DeBuse and Tom Parada. Um, but but no matter where we push those characters, no matter how much they change in, in terms of transposing that literature to screen, ultimately the genesis for those characters came from these two artists. Um, the difference here was I had been filling up a lot of notebooks over the years, and this was one character that I simply could not get to shut up, you know, um, and... I didn't know what I would do with her. I knew she would, she, I knew she was in a hermetic system, um, some kind of power structure. And it had nothing to do with classical music. It, 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 it had, didn't have, I didn't know what it had to do with. I knew that she was at a, a top an organization. Um, and right at the beginning of uh, the first lockdown in March, 2020, um, the studio had come to me and said, you know, would you ever write a film about a conductor? And I was like, the conductor? Um, that seems really boring, you know? Um, I don't I don't think I would want to do that, you know? Um, and I had, I had I had a writing assignment maybe 15 years before that, just a piece of writing um, that was about a young conductor. So I, I, I tiptoed into that world, but I didn't know a great deal about it. Uh, but then the world shut down, you know? Um, and I thought, wow, well, um, I don't have anything else to do. Um, and then I remembered 
wait a minute, I've got this character. That's what she'll do. And, um, you know, I was stuck here at the, in this chair, and um, so was everybody else in their chair. And I was very, very lucky because John Macherry, uh, who had been Leonard Bernstein's assistant for, you know, 18 years and had conducted, you know, um, movie nights for the Hollywood Bowl and taught at Yale, et cetera, et cetera, was also stuck in his chair. Um, and he agreed uh, basically to give me a few weeks of his time on the telephone. Um, and so that's really sort of how it started, you know. And once you go into the world of concert music or classical music, um, there's a lot to get excited about, you know. Um, uh, and to have the enthusiasm of an amateur walking into that world, um, it, it, it's so rich, you know, the history of it is so um, uh, incredible. Um, and, and I had to kind of come in there with like a, and try to fall in love really fast because I had to figure out what did she fall in love with? You know, what, what turned her on? What, what, what were her ultimate goals? What were the benchmarks of success for her? Um, uh, and so that was a, you know, that, that was a, um, a stark difference between say in the bedroom and little children and, and tar. Mm -hmm. I'm, want to sort of dig into that a little bit further, but think about it a little bit in terms of the sort of visual style of the film, um, because it does have this very distinctive and again, like quite restrained, but still really ambitious visual style. Um, I thinking about it in relationship to In the Bedroom from 2001 and Little Children in 2006, it feels of a piece with those films in the sense that you seem to have a habit of pairing really explosive or potentially explosive subject matter um, with a kind of stylistic restraint or austerity um, that often gets compared by critics to people like Michael, ha Michael Haneke or Stanley Kubrick, although whether those are austere filmmakers is a question for another time. I'm not convinced by that, but um, the, these comparisons do come up. Um, one rev reviews of Tar, for instance, describe it as controlled, as chilly, demonstrating uh, a, quote, refrigerated sleekness, uh, as one interview in The Guardian put it. Um, and I just wonder if you can think aloud about that for a little bit, um, the way that you employ restraint and subtraction as a way of building stories and telling stories that contend with really explosive and difficult subject matter. Um, I'm just thinking as I was watching the film again and thinking about it in the context of your work, I thought about Sissy Spacek's line from In the Bedroom, uh, where she's describing the grief of losing her son. Sorry, spoiler alert to everybody in the theater. Sorry. Um, she wrote, she says at one point, it comes in waves, then nothing like a rest in music, silent, but so loud. Um, and it felt to me as almost sort of like a statement about your style as a filmmaker. So I wonder if you can just think about that a little bit for us. Oh, bless you, Tyler. You're the first person to ever say that. You just found the, the sort of uh, Rosetta Stone for me, that line. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of it. I think you kind of, you put your finger right on it. Um, you know, I started out uh, as a musician um, and sort of wandered into uh, uh, the theatrical arts, uh, you know, um, by happenstance. And so music was really important to me. Um, you know, sound is really important to me. Rhythm is really important to me uh, and always has been, you know, since I was a child. I worked as a young actor um, for several years uh, with all kinds of artists. Um, and the people that I enjoy working with the most had the most intent behind their work. Um, and they weren't, we weren't doing six setups. Uh, I hated acting like that. I didn't like it. Um, you know, actors often get a real bum deal in movies. If not, you know, any actor will tell you with a straight face, it's not an actor's medium. They're total mercy of the filmmaker. Um, and, and you can make a great actor look terrible and you can make a second rate actor look passable in film. It's very plastic, you know? Um, so I, I, you know, since I was a fellow at the American Film Institute, so through this film, I think if you 
I don't think my approach hasn't really changed a great deal. You know, um, I try to do, I try to find where to put the camera, you know, uh, and, uh, and the camera, if the camera is going to move, I want the camera to move with intent. It's really that simple. Um, and I've been really very lucky to work with the performers that I've worked with and collaborate with, with incredible actors, uh, over the years. And it's thrilling for me in, in that collaboration to see what they can do, you know, with no strings and no nets, no safety nets. And, uh, and, you know, every time you cut, the, the audience is aware of it or they're expecting when are they going to cut or when is this going to happen? And, and to try to try to erase that as much as possible so that they have the ability to get involved in, in a film and, um, and hopefully be able to own the film as much as possible because they have a more direct relationship with the performer. It's as simple as that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting that you bring up performance in the context of this question of style, simply because this film obviously turns in these this remarkable set of performances from Kate Blanchett, obviously, but also the the wider cast, Noemi Merlin and Nina Haas, just such an incredible cast and such a wonderful and nuanced set of performances. And as I was preparing for this event, I I read an interview with your wonderful DP, Florian Hoffmeister, uh, in Filmmaker Magazine, where he used a phrase, I can't remember it exactly, but he expressed it. He said that what we wanted to do, Todd and I, was to sort of try and turn editorial control of the film or the editorial work of the film over to the performances. So rather than the editing living just in the edit room in post, that the editing was really the engine behind it was these performances. And there's these moments in the film where that is so clear and it feels almost so daring. I mean, there's obviously the, the really striking long take when Tar is leading the master class at Juilliard, which is an incredible achievement and it's really exhilarating to watch. But the one that struck me this watch uh, was in the interview with Adam Gopnik that sort of opens the film. There is a shot that you hold of Kate Blanchett that's two, three minutes long when she's discussing uh, Gustav Mahler. The camera doesn't move. It doesn't cut back a reverse shot to Gopnik. It's not cut as an interview. You just let Kate act <laughs> um, and you allow that performance to play out as a performance. And it's such a kind of, for what seems like a, a a, a very sort of like uh, static shot, it comes off, it feels very exhilarating um, and quite bold and daring to just let an actor act. Well, that's it. Um, those two scenes specifically, I think that's, uh, I didn't read the, the filmmaker interview, but probably I'm assuming that that's what Florian was referencing were these two scenes. And those two scenes, uh, the contrast between those two scenes um, and then I would argue that the very last scene of the film is really about, so the setup is, you know, she's being interviewed um, and that interview is really the most important performance for, for the character of the film. She is the most nervous about that performance um, that she's rehearsed it. She's rehearsed every line. She's, as, as we could see with her assistant who's mouthing um, her biography that Adam is dutifully reading verbatim. Um, she's left nothing to chance, no joke, no quip, nothing. Um, so that's really kind of the most, even though we've met her in a very agitated state, that's the most in control we're going to see her in the entire story. So it's important that that she has control. Um, in, the, in the scene at Juilliard, We've gone through these, this one sort of prologue scene, but then we've had two very long scenes. The scene um, uh, with Adam at, at, at Lincoln Center, and then the scene at the La Bernardin uh, with uh, uh, Mark Strong, who, play, who plays her benefactor, um, Kaplan. And but what we haven't seen, we haven't seen her move yet. And she spends a great deal of time talking about time. You know, talking about. Um, having I start the clock, I have control of time, and so in, in the in the Juilliard scene, you know, we had talked about that scene a, a lot, and and I kept saying to Florian, you know, it, it's going to be a really tough scene because 
if we if we shoot it, it's going to be like 36 to 100 setups. And it's going to be really boring. She has to have control of it. She has to have control of the tempo of the scene because it's the first time we've seen her move. So we can't cut, you know? And uh, that was a really important decision. Um, and but making that decision was very simple and executing that decision was something else altogether. You know, that was really sort of like months of R&D. We had to invent equipment to do that shot. You know, you can't do it with any existing equipment. Um, and of course, you know, the, that was, that's very technical stuff. The the actual blocking of that scene and, and, and the driving of that scene is done strictly by Kate Blanchett, you know, um, and, and that's really um, the sort of, again, the second time when you see this character who has total control, who has total dominance um, uh, and and is exploiting that dominance in a way that maybe is um, rigged and not very fair. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I just anecdotally, when I was down in the theater watching the film earlier, when this sequence started, I did hear somebody sitting in the row behind me whisper, this is the shot. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it landed, you did great. <laughs> you and Florian did great. You and well, we were hoping that no one would notice it. You know, um, I mean, when we first screened the film in Venice um, and Telluride, you, you'd see people about nine minutes in would say, wait, have they cut yet? You know? It didn't. It wasn't meant to be a, a, a bravado, you know, one Um It was meant, you know, as Florian said in the, in the interview, strictly to have her be in control over of the editorial, for her to be in control of the tempo. Um, that was it. Well, speaking of that control of the tempo and of of Tar as the timekeeper, um, I did sort of want to return to this question of music. Uh, music thematically, music structurally, obviously at the very center of this film, but it's also something that returns in your filmmaking uh, a lot um, as a way of opening out the broader themes of whatever story you happen to be telling. Um, and it seems to be a way in your filmmaking where you try and contend with this friction between a desire for control and the volatility of things like desire and feeling and all of these human messy things that get in the way of our designs on control. Um, so music, obviously, especially in this film, it's on the one hand about expression and emotion and, sen and sensuality and sensation. But on the other, particularly for Tar, it's about meticulous control. It's about arrangement and order and hierarchy. Um, and in the character of Tar and so the space of the podium, those two things converge with her, right? It's where she gives almost sermons about the the affective and emotional power of music, but it's also the place where she ritually humiliates her first cellist and embarrasses Sharon by touching Olga's face after the solo. Um, and it's really in the conversation with Gopnik, she starts to imagine herself on the podium as God, right? The person who sets the universal clock in motion. You can't start without me. Right. Um, she's the let there be light. <laughs> Um, but these things also come up in, in the bedroom. Sissy Spacek is a choral teacher. Um, significant events in that film happen around the instruction of music and, and the act of conducting. Um, and you obviously are a musician, have a background in music. So I just wonder if you can think um, for the audience a little bit about the way that music and musicality um, shapes the way you work as a filmmaker. Hmm. I don't know. I, I mean, it probably not not in a way that's uh, terrifically conscious, to be honest with you. Um, I mean, when I'm working on material uh, like I am now, um, I'll typically find, uh, like a lot of people that 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 work on scripts or or fiction, um, you know, I mean, I have a fiction writer friend, all he does is listen to pink noise famously, you know. Um, but I'll typically I'll find a track or two or three tracks. And if they feel right, that's all I'll listen to when I write a script. Um, and so they're kind of baked into the DNA of, um, of the material. Um, and that music may or may not ever see the light of day after I leave a, my desk, you know? Um, sometimes I'll play music on, on set if there's no dialogue, you know? Um, and in this case, uh, 
especially because the first person that I met with when I was on the ground in Berlin was Hildur Gondadotter. Um, and Hildur, uh, you know, one of the first questions she asked me, she said, um, what were you listening to when you wrote the script? And I said, well, there's this many things, but there's this one piece in particular. And I played it for her. And she said, well, what does that piece mean to you? I said, it feels like her engine. And he, she said, okay, well, then that's her internal rhythm. That's 120 beats per second. So let's let's write something. Let me write something for at, at that beat. Um, and maybe we use it, maybe you don't use it, but something that you could play on set or put into her ear. Okay, now what about Sharon? And so basically we tempo mapped all the characters. So, uh, you know, um, Sophie Cower, the young cellist who uh, plays uh, Olga Makina, you know, her tempo was 60 beats a minute, so half, right? Um, so in that way, uh, just in terms of what you don't hear, just but what you would see just on a, on a metronomic uh, way, music was very important or tempo was important. And I, I think more, I think tempo is more important uh, than anything, more than anything having to do with a high line or a lyric or anything like that. It's, it's, it's really just a, a pulse, you know. Well, I want to obvi I want to address this sort of, I guess, elephant in the room, which is the character of Tar. Let's talk a little bit about Tar herself, because okay. um, obviously she's the center of the film in many ways. Um, but I, you have mentioned you mentioned earlier in our conversation, and you've mentioned in other interviews as well that this is a character that you couldn't get to shut up, that stuck with you for a long time. I've heard you describe her as sort of like a devil or an angel on your shoulder. Um, and appropriately in the film, she criticizes her own New Yorker performance as being too garrulous, right? She can't stop talking, these sorts of things. Um, so I'm just curious, what was it about this character of Tar or this idea um, that wouldn't let you go? Um, and what questions or problems did she allow you to think about that maybe some other character wouldn't allow you to access? I think that, you know, she kind of has a Arthur Jensen complex, you know, uh, and she thinks that everybody else is Howard Beale in a way, I think, you know, it's that she feels like she's always the smartest person in a room. Um, and I think she's also a character who, you know, when I first started thinking about her, uh, to be fair to her, because she didn't really announce herself as, you know, from the beginning, she announced herself like, you know, fully formed like today, but in trying to think, okay, how did she become who she is? You know, uh, why is she the way she is? You have to go back to the child, you know? Um, and I think that there's a, uh, she has a lot of chips on her shoulder, you know? Um, and she has, um, so proclivities based on uh, all kinds of things having to do with her makeup and who she is a person, regardless of her background. Um, but but she, there's also a lot of overcompensating that she does. I mean, um, so I, I think that she found real salvation as a young person in the most unlikely sort of form of culture, uh, given her background. Um, and then ran toward it in a way that was passionate and brutal and um, naive, and that I, and that someone who actually came from a, a much closer background to what would typically happen in terms of ascension, in terms of apprenticeship, in terms of schooling, uh, would never allow themselves to have even imagined that they could um, sort of you know, climb these lofty heights that this character has. So um, it's complicated. I mean, when we meet her, she, you know, she's turning 50. She's thinking about legacy. Um, she's achieved almost comically, you know, uh, and impossibly so many things, you know, that there's nothing left, you know. Um, and all of these things are sort of, uh, you know, coming to to roost at the same time, including um, some of her behavior, which uh, has been enabled based on, you know, the sort of 
unfortunate truths of, of how power works. Um, and um, it's a really rough few weeks for her. Mm. So. Yeah, there's people have had better weeks than, than that. <clears throat> well, one aspect of her biography um, that you're careful to sort of cultivate in, in these very subtle ways, but I, I think are really compelling, um, is actually the foundation of her work as a composer. She did not begin as a composer. She did not begin as a conductor, but she was an ethnomusicologist. Um, and the film makes that very clear right from the jump with this extended credit sequence that rolls over top of audio of her doing field recordings um, with the Shinibo Kobibo, or Ko, I can't recall the, the exact pronunciation, but... Um, down in the Amazon. Right. Um, and I think this is such an interesting choice um, to take this character who is so, by the time we meet her as Tar, she's so completely sealed in this world of elite culture and elite cultural institutions. And she's so cultivated her, her persona, her mystique. She's no longer Linda Tar from Staten Island. She's Lydia Tar with the little accent, which is a very kind of like hilariously like middle brow way to imagine being like kind of mid-Atlantic and European. I think that's a very funny detail. Um, but by the time we meet her, she's become this other person. But the foundation of her career really lies in this other cultural space, this other professional space. Um, and it's not the sealed environment of, of classical music in Berlin. It's cross-cultural encounter. It's global right. South, global North encounter. Um, and so I wonder if you can speak about your choice to begin the film in that place, to make that the foundation of her biography. Um, and then also speak a bit about one of the ways that you mark that in the film, which is with this photo that hangs in her Berlin flat where she works, which was created by David Diaz-Gonzalez, yeah. um, which our patrons down in the theater were able to view and, and learn a little bit about this afternoon. So you can just talk about those things together. Okay, well, well, I mean, the idea about her um, going into, you know, uh, getting her doctorate in ethnomusicology I thought was important because here's a character that, you know, has gotten a scholarship, presumably, especially given her background to Harvard. Um, and what I imagine is she went there and she was very, very uh, excited and she maybe had, and she was able to get through things, but she had a little bit of a breakdown. Um, and, uh, and she wasn't that far from the student Max that she goes after in this Juilliard class. She, you know, she, she, there by the grace of God go I. She was Max. Uh, she wanted to do, she wanted to break glass ceiling. She wanted to change things up. She wasn't interested in, in canonical work or dead white man music or any of that, nothing patriarchal at all. Um, and she wanted to get her doctorate and she, and she needed a change of scenery. Um, and so when she goes down to the Ugali um, River Valley in eastern Amazon, you know, it's like 1989, 1990. Now that area today is fairly well trod, you know, by a lot of um, uh, new age tourism, for lack of a better term, um, and people going down there and having high ayahuasca trips and things like that. It's fairly mainstream and um, but back then it would have been not the case, you know, uh, back then, the only sort of people that had been few and far between people that were doing that sort of field work down there. Um, you know, if you go back and look at like the Field Museum, or you look at um, uh, uh, the Smithsonian, they're, 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 they chronicled it, but um, they were kind of the first people down there, you know. Um, so I wanted it to be something that felt um, uh, like it had real intent uh, for her. Um, now, part of that field work, um, you know, is um, is very practical. It, you're you're logging and you're um, chronicling and you're and and you're going you're taking a deep dive into uh, the origin of culture. You know, the origin of of, of story, the origin of song. In this case, with the Icaros. Um, but also, you know, essentially the idea is that she, as much as one can, um, you know, participated in ceremony. So if, if, if you'd ever spent time uh, in such a ceremony, you know, the idea is about shedding your ego. It's about 
changing, uh, taking off a mask and, and seeing, you know, what's really underneath and all of this. So I, I imagine that she had come out of that experience a very, very different uh, individual than the individual that went to Harvard. Um, and that had a huge, very, very powerful trans, you know, uh, portation for her, where when she went back into concert music, she had a point of view that was very fresh and very powerful and she felt strong. Um, and so all of this other, you know, all of her other sort of, um, biography, um, uh, this very potent biography of look, work, working with the Caroline Shaws of the world and working with the Hildur Gundadars of the world and, and still working outside of the canon uh, was was kind of how she rose. But ultimately, you know, it's like the old saying, like, you know, when you're young, you want to live on the cool street where there's graffiti and broken glass. And when you're, you know, my age, you, you know, you're just looking for, you know, a, uh, you know, a, a clean toilet. So uh, I think that, you know, ultimately she became the thing that she never wanted to become, right? So now she's sitting atop this, the, the, the largest cultural uh, institution for classical music that exists today. Um, and that involves human resources and, and, and politics and winks and nods and favors and um, and decision-making that as, as a group and, and all of these things that um, she's not so equipped to deal with in a, in a healthy manner, you know? Um, so I think there's the contrast of when she was at, at a very specific age, say Max's age until she was maybe 29, 30. Um, and now, now she's 50, she's twice that age, right? Um, and so, you know, so sort of leaping ahead, say to the Juilliard scene, you know, when she's, she's kind of speaking to herself in a way, you know, um, I mean, that's one of the things that's happening. She's kind of trying to tell her young self, don't bother. This is what really matters. Um, and in another way, she's she's literally just bitter because the person that, she, of course, she's shooting down, uh, Anna Thorba's daughter, you know, um, is younger um, and is writing the kind of music that she's been struggling to write and that she threw out the film um, and, and is praised for doing it, you know? Um, and I think that, that for me, that was really important, which is that she goes after the student first. And why does she go after them? She goes after them because she's jealous. She's envious, you know? Right. Um, and I wonder if you could just speak a little bit about how the collaboration with Zapiri Ground and uh, and David came about um, for the way that that's one of the those one of the key ways that that element of her biography sort of like persists in the film. And I think it's really crucial that it's included and that it's it's part of the world of the film because I think it opens up this completely other way of thinking about that as a film that's not about or not singly about this rarefied elite space of cultural production, but it's really a story about the global terrain of culture and cultural power and cultural authority and where decisions get made about what canon counts and these sorts of things. So if you can just introduce us to sure. um, the, the collaboration that brought that image about. Well, the, one of the first things, the, 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 the whole, um, and it's, these are these things are always um, dangerous, you know, to, to chronicle because you never know if you really get it right. But as if I, if I remember this correctly, the reason that I um, I sort of wound up in the neighborhood of of, of David, um, and with this as an idea of the place that she would go, was I had stumbled across an image of, that David had uh, a, a photograph of his that was so um, haunting um, and that that I couldn't, you know, it, he get cast a spell. I couldn't stop thinking about it. And so I wanted to know who was the photographer? Uh, where was this? I had no idea. I just saw an image, you know? Um, and, and that's kind of what, what got me um, probably into the idea of the Shipibo Kanibo in the first place. Um, and so when I was in, uh, I, I turned to Nigel Wool, who was um, our executive producer and our line producer on the film. Uh, and I said, I have this image. I don't know where David is. I can't find him online. Can you find him? 
And um, about two weeks later, he said, I've just gotten off the phone with Jack Wheeler. And, um, and uh, would you like to speak with David, you know, uh, in it, this afternoon? I was like, oh, yeah, great, 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 great. So um, we started talking and David, if you've seen that image, uh, you know, it's, that's, that's a ceremony. She's in the middle of ceremony. Um, and Ruperto, who was the shaman uh, in that photograph, um, that really came from David. That was, that was a really important collaboration because I, when I talked to him, I said, I don't know. I just want, I, I want there to be some kind of uh, absolute. There has to be a, a, a record. We don't have to point at it or anything, but we have to have a record that she was there. And I had come up with a, several different ideas. And he, and he said, well, I think it should be in ceremony. And um, and the moment he said that, I said, OK, that's great. And then we had to figure out how to do that, you know. Um, and that was a that was a very interesting technical exercise for David and, and for us. Um, and it involved sharing of equipment and measurements and light sources and all the usual things of photography. And then ultimately we took David and David's work and Ruperto, and then we um, brought it to Berlin with Olaf Hein and brought Kate into it. And, and, and that's so how that image was created. So that was really, that was really important. And that was a very, that was a first step long before we made the film. Um, the other one is what you point out, it, which is the beginning credits, you know? Um, and uh, again, this idea of going to, um, that part of the world into that culture, shedding the ego, letting everything go, you know, um, it was sort of self-apparent, you know, that, uh, that one way of, of illustrating that would be, uh, the last is first and the first is last, you know, in terms of credits. And also, um, uh, it, because we're dealing with the film, obviously it has to do with hierarchy. She spends a good deal of time talking to Adam about the Shipibo Kanibo, and she compares the way that um, their interpretation of song or an Icaro compared to, say, uh, Leonard Bernstein's. Um, uh, she, she, you know, there's much said about that, but the only opportunity we would actually have to hear that without having to know what it is in this kind of ethnographic field recording is during the beginning credits. And so, um, you know, we were very, very lucky because Stephen Griffiths, who was our sound designer, his nephew, uh, Zach Griffiths, had just graduated from the University of London School of African and Oriental Studies for Ethnomusicology in London. And, and he, um, he, we flew him down there and he went up the river for two days and he um, met with uh, Mama Lisa, who's another shaman, um, uh, Lisa Vargas Fernandez um, at the San Quinente Center. And, and she, you know, an Icaro comes uh, through the shaman and, um, and, and she sang this curamente for us for, um, for the film and, um, and just for us, you know, and um, uh, that was a, that was a really powerful thing, you know, it was a, um, and a really important thing. And it was a, it, it was a, both of these collaborations involved um, intense amounts of dialogue and coordination. So there was real meaning for us uh, just through process together. Right. Um, I just want to think about this a little bit more because I think this, this detail of her biography, um, when you see it in the course of the larger film, to me, it really transformed the way I watched the film from the first time I saw it, simply because it suddenly made it clear, or it made it seem to me that the film is, um, not necessarily what it has been portrayed by in a lot of criticism or popular writing, which is a kind of gender swapped me to like, wouldn't it be wacky if, if an abuser was a woman sort of thing? Um, it like that to me sort of can constrains the film and its analysis of power in a certain way. Um, and of course the film engages that it references Placido Domingo and, and these sorts of things. I mean, it's present in the film, but I'm also conscious of the way that throughout the film, the presence of her time in the Amazon, um, uh, the place of Asia and other parts of the global South break in again and again and again, um, and make themselves known. Sometimes literally somebody appears to be perhaps breaking into her home, however, bunker-like and etching the markings that are placed on her face on the back of the metronome cover. 
um, or leaving them in Plato in Petra's room or engraving or marking them on the inside cover of that copy of Vita Sackville West's challenge. Um, there's a brief moment between Tar and Francesca where uh, Tar is frustrated at Deutsche Grammophon's reluctance to give the recording a full LP release and do digital only. And Francesca says, oh, well, this other composer is going to get a proper LP recording. And Tar flippantly says, oh, well, of course, the Chinese market's crazy, right? Yes, Lang Lang. Sense. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Lang Lang, who's Sophie Cower, who pl- who's the uh, cellist in the film, is actually playing with Lang Lang. Uh, wow right now as we speak so so there's this there's a sense that it's there's a different set of cultural poles a different set of cultural activities and gatekeepers and leaders that tar doesn't seem to be aware that she's not a part of or maybe she is aware that she's not a part of and um and of course ultimately in the film's final act she ends up in southeast asia suddenly subject to a whole cultural world, adjunct to a whole cultural world that she was very likely entirely ignorant of before. And I couldn't stop thinking about, you know, and she begins the film by saying, you can't start without me. And then as it turns out, the film ends with her entering a world that's been going on the whole time without her anyway, right? That there's a whole realignment of cultural power happening in the film um, that I think is a much broader question than just like, she behaved badly in this elite cultural space in Berlin. It's a larger question about cultural power, it seems to me. Yeah, I, I, the lens, I think, is important, you know, because there's a, you could say, oh, she fell from power and oh, look where she is. And the thing is, is that you could look at it a whole other lens, which is, um, I mean, the, she's a conductor. A conductor has to have an instrument. An instrument are human beings. Um, so a conductor without human beings is mute and silent. Um, the one thing that she, you know, uh, the one thing that she loses that she underlines at the beginning is she loses control of time in so much as at the end she's handed us headphones um, and presumably she's listening to a click track. But outside of that, anyone will tell you, Hilda Grundedager will tell you this, um, any major composer um, and many conductors, um, video games are really, really important. And some of the finest music being composed right now and underscoring going on today is for video games. Video games are choose your own adventure situations. They're they're variable. Um, There's all kinds of things that can be done with them. Um, It's far from... um, uh, some being banished or exiled into some Dante's Inferno. It's um, it's very mainstream, um, and it's certainly um, more lucrative um, and more uh, popular, obviously, um, than than classical music. Um, so yeah, you're right. The scales have fallen from a very particular uh, set of lenses that she's been looking through, and um, and she's going to see a different world, you know. Um, and maybe that world will, maybe she'll, um, she'll see things differently or maybe she won't, you know. Todd, thank you so much for joining us. I can't tell you what a delight it is for the center, what a delight it is for our audience down in the theater and not to be a weenie, but for me personally, I'm a huge fan of your filmmaking and a huge fan of this film. Um, so it's been a real delight to chat with you and we appreciate your time so much. I appreciate your time and thank you guys for for coming tonight and uh, and Tyler, thank you for the conversation. I, I really appreciate it.